recording in progress. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Fort Worth. Today is Friday, March 15th. It is stormy outside and wet, but inside it looks uh, like a really good crowd today. So glad each and every one of you are here with us. Mike Yelda, please join me in uh, welcoming past President J.R. Labby, partner, chief communications officer at CSE Leadership, LLC, for our invocation, followed by Harriet Harrell, principal of the Harrell Group, with our national anthem. Please rise with me. Thank you, Kirk. Join me, please, as we reflect on how fortunate we are. Creator of all, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather each week in the spirit of service and friendship. We stand before you humbled by the blessings of this day, the food and the hands that prepared it, the fellowship of friends, old and new, and the good fortune we have to be part of Rotary. We know this world is not so generous to all of your children. In this community of plenty, many still struggle to make it from one day to the next. Help us see the humanity of those who are invisible to so many and lead us to respond with compassion. Clear our minds to accept new truth when we hear it and let that truth be felt in our hearts so we are moved to do good for others. Help us rise to the challenges we encounter and to use our resources of influence, intellect, and energy to leave this community better than how we found it. As Rotarians, may we always be a voice of reason. May this place always be a place of acceptance, and may we never stop striving to put service above self. Amen. Amen. appropriate play ball is right especially with today's program all right to welcome our visitors I'd like to introduce Regina Thodden president of Fort Worth Museum of Science and History where are you at Regina here she comes come on up okay good afternoon everyone uh, my pleasure to welcome our guest today, uh, and please forgive me if I mangle any names, I apologize. Uh, Jody Newton, who is a guest of Chris Kobler. Please just wave and let us know you're here. Pete Colburn, who is a guest of Mark Moore. Stacy Henderson, a guest of Jim Austin. Mark Lewis. Kelly, who is a visiting Rotarian from Grapevine. <laughs> Gary Tonagas, who is past president, uh, David Campbell's visitor. <laughs> J.D. Stotts, um, guest of Mike Herman. <laughs> Rebecca Engbritson, uh, Cheryl Gillihan's visitor. Yes. <laughs> Gary Miller, guest of Robert Vargo. 
Nick Dumbold, a guest of Edna Glynn. <laughs> Jessica McCone, guest of David Campbell. <laughs> and we have a number of guests here from Rosa Bredeja and Ben Robertson at a reserve table here. <laughs> okay, members of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, Annette Linderis, who is the CEO. and a board member of the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Uh, Isabel Lozano. Uh, Gilberto, excuse me, Gilberto Ataide. Christian Argueto Soto. Jimena Artista Zapata. And Laura Sanchez Kincaid. Thank you very much, Regina. And now it's time for our four-way test. So to all of our visitors here, the four-way test is something that we as Rotarians use as somewhat of a filter. And we uh, try to push everything we think, say, or do through this filter. And if it doesn't come out with a yes, then we try not to think, say, or do those things. If you will, please repeat along with me. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it build goodwill and better friendship? And number four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Now, before we get into the newscast, I would like to remind everyone here in the rotograph, and uh, you should have gotten emails on this, the, uh, our membership committee, no, not our membership committee, what is it, the, um, thank you. Um, we sent out a survey. Please take that survey, members. Uh, that survey is your opportunity to push your voice up to the board and to our strategic planning committee so that we know what we're, what we're gonna try and push forward in in the next three years, okay? Survey's right there. If you haven't seen it, it's also in the rotograph. And again, in some emails, please check those. We'd really like to get some good participation because the more participation, the better a feel we have of the pulse of this club. So, now on to the newscast. I'd like to introduce Tom Williams, partner, Haynes and Booth, for the newscast. Come on. Well, thank you, President Kurt. Thank you. Today is the Ides of March. I feel about as welcome as Julius Caesar in the Roman Senate. <laughs> Today is also the day that Wordle appeared for the 1,000th time. Today was the 1,000th game, 1,000th appearance of the online game where you try to guess a five-letter word in six tries. I got a five today in case anyone's interested. Um, but it's, it's fitting that Wordle's anniversary was this week because this week both President B-I-D-E-N and former President T-R-U-M-P uh, clinched their respective uh, political party's presidential nominations, ensuring that, for, that this November, for the first time since 1912, we will have a November general election in which an incumbent president is being challenged by a former president. When asked about that historical anomaly, President Biden said, well, I wasn't quite old enough to vote that year. <laughs> but I uh, yes. I remember it well. <laughs> of course, President Biden and former President Trump will not be the only candidates this year. As always, there are some third party candidates, some independent candidates, the most notable of, of whom appears to be Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And if you thought uh, Kennedy's campaign could get any stranger and more weird than it already was, uh, Kennedy said this week that he was considering selecting New York Jazz quarterback Aaron Rodgers to be his running mate. <laughs> Kennedy said that he liked Rodgers because he's battle tested. He did not say in what battle the quarterback had been tested, but it obviously was not any 2023 NFL game since he only played one down. <laughs> Former President Trump has also been floating various names for uh, possible running mates uh, that, he, that he says he's considering. 
One of the names frequently mentioned is that of South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem. The governor, like many politicians, decided that perhaps uh, she should uh, spruce up her smile a little bit, and so she decided to get some cosmetic dental work done this week. Uh, that would not have been especially remarkable, except for the fact that she traveled 1,200 miles from South Dakota to Sugarland, Texas, to get the work done at a place called Smile, Texas. And then she posted a five minute video on all of her social media platforms uh, talking about how great it was and how much uh, she appreciated the great work they did and gave her a smile I can be proud of. That naturally set off many of the governor's political opponents in South Dakota who wanted to know uh, if the state paid for this trip, if the uh, dental clinic uh, paid her, uh, if they gave her you know, free cosmetic dentistry, uh, all of which we do not know. But to me, the most interesting part of her little five minute infomercial was where she said that when the clinic called her and said they could uh, treat her, she immediately got on an airplane, flew to Houston and arrived at two in the morning. So, yeah, Christy, this is Dr. Dean's office. We have an opening at 2 a.m. Can you be here? Uh, the other big news this week was the overwhelming vote in the House of Representatives to require TikTok either to separate from its Chinese parent corporation or be banned in the United States. Uh, the, the vote really did attract bipartisan support. House Speaker Mike Johnson supported the bill, as did former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Uh, Pelosi actually gave a floor speech uh, to e express her support for the bill, but she said it really isn't an effort to ban TikTok, it's an effort to make it better. And then she said, tic tac toe which ensured that everybody on TikTok who is younger than 50, which is essentially everyone, had absolutely no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> President, Biden, President Biden said that if the bill reaches his desk, he will sign it. The president posted that statement on his campaign's TikTok account. <laughs> A terrorist plot was averted this week. There was a, there was some online chatter of a terrorist plot to hijack a commercial airliner, but the plot was thwarted happily. The terrorists changed their mind when they found out the plane was made by Boeing. <laughs> Emma Stone had a busy week this week. On Sunday, she won an Academy Award for Best Actress for the second time in her career, winning the award for her, uh, for her role in Poor Things. Then on Monday, she spent most of the morning on the phone with Louis Vuitton customer service trying to get a refund for her damaged dress. Uh, after being told at least six times by a recording that all representatives are busy assisting other customers, but your call is very important to us. Uh, she finally reached a human being who told her that since the dress had already been worn, she could not get a refund, but as a token of customer goodwill, she could have a $25 store credit. <laughs> As for the weekend weather, on t tomorrow uh, will be pretty cool and a little R-A-I-N-Y, uh, but the weather should improve Sunday for St. Patrick's Day, and of course uh, next week is the first day of spring, and if it's the first day of spring, opening day can't be far behind. Have a good weekend. Great job, Tom. Thank you so much. Past President David Campbell, Vice President Hewitt Zollers, come on up here. I take it you won the Masters. Maybe. Maybe. Well, come on up here and give us an announcement. You know, they say you can't really find something in a few days. Well, I can attest to it that you can. You can argue that the Open Championship is the greatest golf tournament that it's ever been. If you would have asked me before that, uh, if you could win a tournament, what would you pick? I probably would have said the Masters, US Open 1, 1A, but having seen how the, the Open Championship is perceived around the world, I'm very happy that's the one I won. 
So going when you think about the uh, Mount Rushmore of sporting events, you think of the World Series, you think of the Super Bowl, you might think of the World Cup. There's a golf tournament up there, and I know there's a golf tournament up there. Now, I'm not talking about the Masters. I'm talking about the Rotary Golf Tournament. That is way up there. <laughs> so this year, we're, we're hosting it again at, at uh, Ridgely Country Club. It's going to be a great day. It's lunch. It's heavy appetizer dinner. It's open bar all day. It's, it's on a fantastic golf course. Key is that person, Todd Hamilton, will be there. He won the 2004 British Open. He's bringing the Claret Jug with him. There's going to be a Beat the Pro on one of the par threes. Get it, in, get it closer to the hole than him. You're going to win some golf balls. But he's also going to be there for question and answer and doing a clinic. And I'm truly fascinated by a golfer who truly was a journeyman. But that one weekend, he hit the six and he beat the likes of Ernie Els, he beat the likes of Phil Mickelson, and he won the British Open. And to be able to talk to a person like that and see the claret jug that he was given is kind of special. At the time he won that, there were only 132 other winners. He was 133. So come out and join us. The scan's there. Uh, we've got some great sponsors. We need some more sponsors, but come out and join us, put in a team, and come enjoy the day at the Rotary Golf Tournament. True Mount Rushmore sporting events. Thank you, Past President David. Now, Mandy Compton, Secretary and retired federal prosecutor. I believe we have two first readings. Come on up. Good afternoon. We have two first readings today. The proposed members are number one, Chris Harris, Vice President of Defense, Company Speed 3D. Um, classification, manufacturing, defense, and his proposer is Corey Harris. Our second proposed member is Robert Wright, director of CCMR, company Fort Worth ISD, classification, education, and the proposer is Don Click. Robert is a transfer from the Keller Golden Triangle Rotary. If no written objections are received in the Rotary Office by March 22nd, these proposals will be given second readings and voted on by the club. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We have a blue badge presentation. Ray Scheidler, come on up here. Where you at, Ray? Give me that back. Thank you. And now on to the main event. I'd like to introduce the chairman of the day, Mike Herman, Chief Financial Officer, Whitley Penn. Come on up here and tell us all about our speaker today. Thank you. First, I want to give a shout out to uh, John Fletcher for helping us get in touch with our speaker. I don't know if John's here today or not. Uh, you got me introducing another baseball guru since I'm a baseball fan, and I have a nephew who is a scout for the Chicago Cubs and formerly with the Texas Rangers. Uh, Rob Matwick is no stranger to our Rotary Club. Rob has presented to us on several occasions since joining the Texas Rangers Ball Club in 2008. He was promoted to Executive Vice President of Business Operations in 2014, which the position he currently holds. This is Rob's 38th season in Major League Baseball. Previously, he spent more than 21 years with the Houston Astros, including having responsibilities for many aspects of the construction of Minute Maid Park, where he oversaw all aspects of ballpark operations after the facility opened in 2000. Wow, it's already that old. He also <clears throat> did a brief stint as Vice President of Communications for the De Detroit Tigers before joining the Rangers in 2008. Rob was instrumental in negotiations with the City of Arlington and the ballot approval for the construction of Globe Life Field. He also had key negotiation roles in other high-profile 
profile Arlington Entertainment District developments, including Texas Live, the Lowe's Hotel, and most recently the National Medal of Honor Museum. He is the current chairman of the board of directors of the Arlington Convention and Visitors Bureau and serves on the boards of the Greater Arlington Chamber of Commerce and the Arlington Entertainment Area Management District. Rob has received many awards, including induction to the Texas Baseball Hall of Fame in 2005. He is a native of McKessport, Pennsylvania. Anybody know where that is? I looked it up. South Pittsburgh. He, he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from the University of South Carolina at Aiken, Aiken, and Masters of Mass Communication degree from the University of South Carolina in Columbia. Rob and his wife Kelly have a daughter, Mackenzie, and reside in South Lake. And again, so that I don't become the program, welcome Rob Metwood. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Mike, appreciate the introduction. Trust me, if Fletch were in the room today, we would all know it. So uh, he's got me speaking in Grapevine next week, and somehow he convinced me to make a speech uh, to the Chamber of Commerce in Southlake on opening day this year, which normally we don't do those things on opening day, but since the game got moved to 6.30 for ESPN, I figured what the heck. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of pacing and a lot of anxious time on any opening day. And like I said, like Mike said, I've been through 38 of them. This why I should be, this why I should be 39 this year. Uh, so, you know, looking forward to it, but also looking forward to get out, getting out of the office for a couple hours and uh, joining, joining friends and neighbors uh, like we have here today in Fort Worth. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I tell you, I literally waited. Last year was the first time that I had been with the organization that won the World Series. So, like I said, I waited 38 years to experience that. So, it was really cool uh, to do it in Arizona because my brother lives there. So, uh, as my last surviving family member, it was really emotional for me that night for him to be there with me and to have his kids and to experience that was really pushed it over the top for me. But, but the entire experience itself was just remarkable. Now, I would have loved to have brought the World Series trophy here today. Unfortunately, it's on a trophy tour. So I did the next best thing. I brought a picture of it. <laughs> so there it is. Uh, hopefully, because it is out on tour, you might have a chance to see it somewhere. We've had it at the ballpark several times. We're taking it around the community. I know several businesses have had it. Uh, at their places of work uh, during the day, but hopefully you'll run into, into it somewhere along the way. Uh, it's a beautiful Tiffany piece, and uh, we're, we're certainly proud to uh, display it here in the community. Now, this next slide is just a picture of game one. Now, you know, I, I put this picture in, I'm in the picture. Uh, my daughter and I are actually holding the bottom left corner of the American flag there. And I know you can't see that, uh, but I, I did, I, I do like to include that picture, but also because game one was pretty remarkable when you stop and think about it. I would argue, I think the most, but you could argue two of the most iconic home runs in the history of the franchise were hit in that game, right? Uh, if you are the Arizona Diamondbacks, much like we did in 2011, where we were one strike away twice, were not for Corey Seager coming up down two runs, one out, bottom of the ninth, and making this historic swing, you know, I'm sure the D-backs spent the winter thinking we should have gone home up 2-0, you know, <laughs> since they beat us in game two. Uh, and, and you could certainly make a case for that, although the way we played on the road, you know, We'll, we'll see how that would have played out. But I love this picture, and there have been a lot of different angles taken of this one. But if you look, so over in the right side of the image, you can see a few people with, you know, Corey knows how far he hit the ball. You can see the expression on his face. He knows what he just did. There are a couple people there with their arms raised. If you look right above the World Series sign there, you can see some people just sort of still in their seats, and they're not quite sure. And then I love the guy, If the, you see the T on Corey's helmet just to the right. There's a guy in a gray shirt, and he's he's got he got this pose going. Not quite sure what he's thinking. He's probably trying to figure: should I left after the eighth of beaten traffic? Or, uh, but I love that guy. And this is one of the things I love about photography: just capturing this moment 
And like I say, I've probably seen this, and you've probably all seen the videos on social media. Every time I see it on social media, I stop and run it three or four or five or 10 times uh, to relive it again. But I love this isolation and capturing it there because it, it's at that point where he knows what happened, but not everybody else in the crowd did. I think that's probably the most iconic home run in the history of the franchise there. Because if we lose that game and go down 2-0, you know, that's a tough, tough mountain to climb to try to try to fight back in the World Series. And then, of course, two innings later in the 11th, Mr. October slash November this year, uh, Adolis, uh, eight homers, 22 RBIs, and he does it again. And even losing him in game five, you know, this team found, found a way to win. And this guy was a big part of it. I'm really excited to have him coming back for us this year. And then the, the glove toss, right? And I apologize, I cropped that, so that's why the glove's not in it. So uh, bad, bad Photoshop on my part. But the Josh Spores final out, uh, that moment, uh, again, when you talk about iconic moments now in the history of our franchise, you're gonna see that one a lot for years and years to come. And we talk about pitching, you know, think about Nathan Evaldi. I heard something a week or so ago. You know, Nathan was one of only 10 major league pitchers now to start six games for his team in the postseason. But he's the first player whose team won all six of those games. So every time he already took them on, he, he may have not gotten the decision, but the team won. So every time he went out there, he put us in a position to win, which certainly says a lot about Nathan and, and his ability and what he meant to us last year. So tremendous sign, and, and I'm expecting, I don't think Bruce has announced it yet, but I expect to see him pitching on opening day. Uh, 11 and 0 on the road. I don't know in a single postseason. I can't imagine. And you know, like I say, I've watched a lot of baseball over 38 years. I can't imagine that will ever be done again. I mean, you would expect that a team might go 11 and 0 at home, but not 11 and 0 on the road. <clears throat> and you remember the way we ended the season on the road in Seattle. That was a tough weekend. And uh, I don't know what happened on that flight from Seattle to Tampa. You know, but I remember the guy saying, you know, they were waving to the Metroplex as we flew over it on our way to go down there. But I talked to Matt Silverman, the, the president of the Rays, a few weeks ago. They're, they're getting ready to build a ballpark. So we've been collaborating on some elements of what they're doing and try to assist, trying to assist them in their process. And Matt said, you know, we watched your club and we thought, man, we thought you guys are just, you know, it looks like you're beating a little bit coming in here. And in 27 hours, we, we had those guys pushed to the side and out of the way. And then going into Baltimore to start, of course, there's a team, I, I, where's my Oriole fan here that I talked to on the way in, yeah. <laughs> there we go. There's always one in the room, you know. <laughs> but I mean, it, that's a great young club. I mean, you won 104 games, so you think, okay, we got through Tampa pretty quick. You know, maybe in 27 hours, they weren't quite awake yet, and we just took care of business. But to go into Baltimore and win the first two games there, with uh, a very, very excited and active crowd. I mean, it was, was, was pretty amazing. Of course, the Houston series, you know, speaks for itself. Uh, and then this moment, 500 to 700,000 of our closest friends. You know, it was interesting, the, so we win the game, didn't know it at the time when we were going out there. But the plan all along was that both the team and the front office staff that were out there for the games were gonna fly back on the day after. So we win it on a Wednesday night. The plan was to fly by, back Thursday afternoon. I think with the time change, Bruce just wanted to let everybody have a good night's sleep if we're going back to play game six. So, of course, we win it that night. And as you would imagine, the players were at a different hotel than the staff. So they had their party. We had a little get together. But we didn't fly until about one o'clock the next afternoon. So, and, and there was a parade on Friday. Fortunately, we sent a few people back. But I mean, you want to talk, you have that emotional adrenaline rush, the celebration after the game. And then you wake up the next morning and realize, you know what, we've got about a half million people that are going to show up around the ballpark tomorrow for a parade. And we sort of need to get this thing going. So city of Arlington was a great partner. Uh, a few of our key people made it back. I mean, we literally worked all night on that Thursday to get to that moment where we had the parade. And it was a wonderful celebration. So uh, Bruce Bochy, can't say enough about Bruce, uh, with four World Series championships now. I think he is pretty much, if he hadn't already, which I think you could argue he had, punched his ticket to Cooperstown. Uh, he certainly deserves it now. And we're looking forward to getting it all started again uh, in 13 days. So opening day is right around the corner. So if you don't have tickets for the uh, home opener against the Cubs, sorry, they may be a little hard to get at this point. I think there may be a few singles floating around out there. We certainly will be raising a banner. I know Chuck Morgan has got some great things planned around the opener and that celebration. 
to go into the season as a defending World Series champion for the first time uh, is going to be truly remarkable for, for Rangers fans who've stayed with us through these 52 years to get to that point. And if you can't make it to opening night, on the second night of the season, uh, the Saturday night, I expect that we'll be giving out our rings uh, to the players. Uh, staff will get them later, but uh, players will get theirs. We'll do introductions onto the field. So if you can't get there opening day on Thursday against the Cubs, you might think about coming on Saturday to see the ring presentation. I, wow, I don't know what that means. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it means that lightning will strike twice this year. Uh, but the players will get their rings on uh, on Saturday night prior to that second game of the Chicago series. And first two weekends of the season, we get three of the Cubs, four of the Astros. So I was glad to get my Eclipse glasses today because, you know, we play the fourth game of that series is actually on April 8th. Uh, so we, the, the, interestingly, the Astros actually wanted us to play a day game that day for travel, but they're not traveling that far, so we told them no. But, you know, while we were having that conversation, I, I failed to remember that that was also the eclipse day. So uh, I'm glad we did push it to the night. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen here, but looking forward to seeing that. You know, baseball is not your thing, too. I, I just want to throw this out there. The UFL kicks off. So this combination of the XFL and the USFL, we play at Choctaw Stadium, the Arlington Renegades. So that'll be Saturday. March 30th at noon. Uh, they will actually kick off football there. You may or may not know we also play professional rugby at Choctaw Stadium, the Dallas Jackals. And then North Texas Soccer Club, the minor league team for FC Dallas, plays all of its home games at Choctaw Stadium too. And then we do a lot of high school football in the fall. So I do want to assure you that that building is still very viable, and still very busy for us. Uh, and there is some football coming up. So uh, if you're so inclined, and if you can't get enough baseball, uh, we just had three weekends of college baseball in, in February and early March. We're really excited about those. And you know, once again, third year in a row, we'll be hosting uh, the Big 12 Baseball Championship at the end of May. Of course, the last year, the Texas and Oklahoma will be in a part of the conference. But uh, if you want to come out and see some great college baseball, join us for the Big 12. And then this summer, a uh, big event coming up this summer, the All-Star Game. The 94th Major League Baseball All-Star Game will be at Globe Life Field on Tuesday, June 16th, probably right around 7.05. Uh, anybody here remember the last time we hosted the All-Star Game? I'm sure you probably do. 1995, there it is, the ballpark in Arlington. I was a much younger PR director for the Houston Astros at that time. And as we do for big events like this, like the World Series and All-Star Game, we have other people come in to support the home team. So uh, I volunteered to come up and, and help with the game that day. I was back in a room with John Blake doing game notes for the, for the All-Star Game. But I do remember the workout day. I don't know if anybody went to it, but I think it was 113 degrees on the field. So uh, that, that was a memorable day. And uh, but we're looking forward to hosting it inside. This is an image of the lineup of both teams that are on the field. One of the things that's really cool uh, about the All-Star Game, and John shared this with me as we were talking about presentations here a couple of days ago, there were 17 Hall of Fame players on the lines there. So you think about that. 17 of the players lined up in 1995 here in Arlington, here in North Texas ended up going being inducted in the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. So it's that level of competition. Listen, you can say what you want about all-star games. I know, listen, I played basketball through college, not very well, but I played it through college and, you know, the NBA's turned into layups. They've done away with the Pro Bowl. Uh, hockey is pretty much, a, you know, a figure skating contest these days. And I love all those sports, but I think our game has stayed relatively true to it. And I will admit that our guys like to depart as soon as the games are over. Last year, we had six players in Seattle, and after they were all out of the game, we had several of our staff that were up there, you know, shadowing the Mariners people, but we were able to jump on the charter with those guys. So full disclosure, by the sixth inning, we were wheels up and headed back to DFW too, because these guys wanted to get to their days off. But it'll be a great event. When you have this level of talent, and all collected in one place. Uh, it's going to be a good show, but there's a lot more to it these days. Baseball has done a good job of trying to extend the week. Now, this picture of a vacant lot being scraped uh, is actually Center Park, S-E-N-C-E-R, Park in Arlington. A few years ago, Major League Baseball came up with the idea of leaving a legacy project in the community. So this technically is really what I consider to be the first all-star event that we did. So January 26th, we did a groundbreaking at Center Park uh, the Optimus Club actually runs the park now, and there's a picture of Corey and Maddie Seeger. They are contributing financially to support 
this project. And if you see in the lower left corner, there's sort of a, a box there, a little rectangle over on that side. Those are the Cory Seeger batting cages. So Cory has contributed the money to install batting cages at Center Park, which they've never had before. Uh, Rangers and Major League Baseball are contributing the funds to put in two new fields, new lights, stands, cover and protection over the stands, you know, restrooms, concession stands. So this will be the legacy project. The timing, we started in January, so the objective is to have the project complete in July. So, of course, Commissioner Manfred can show up on site, walk up, complete a project, he cuts the ribbon, but the benefit is the community gets a beautiful renovated ballpark for our young people to, to play on here. So that's the Center Park project, and that is underway now, uh, maybe not working today, but work is uh, progressing on Center Park. It's funny, I spoke at the Arlington Rotary two weeks ago, and they had a number of members come up to me afterward and said, you know, I played at Center Park when, when I was a kid, I used to play at that ballpark. So they were very, the Optimist Club in Arlington actually runs it now. But they were very excited to see the work that's being done there, and, and we're proud to be part of that. I will say, too, that we're not just contributing in Arlington. We're working with the Boys and Girls Clubs here in Fort Worth uh, to help fund the renovation for that facility, too. I heard this week there's a musician, in fact, I've got a slide in here of him uh, named Kane Brown, who will be performing at Globe Life Field later this year in September. Uh, Kane heard about the project, and he's contributing $50,000 $50, to it to renovate the music room at the Boys and Girls Club uh, where we're doing the bigger, bigger renovations. So we're really excited to have Kane contribute. And there'll be, there'll be some media coming out. Hopefully this is not live anywhere today, but there'll be some media coming out on that <laughs> a little bit later in the summer. So when you get to the All-Star Weekend itself, uh, the HBCU Classic, we're really excited about this year. This was a concept uh, that originated with Ken Griffey Jr. Of course, Ken spent most of his playing career in Seattle. And Ken wanted to do something to help support the All-Star Initiative there. So there are 17 HBCU schools across the country that play Division I baseball. So Ken's idea was to bring the best players at the HBCU schools together and have them participate in the All-Star Weekend. So they did it last year in Seattle. Had about 9,000 people uh, that attended the game. Nice turnout. Of course, here, in, in we feel we're much closer to a number of the HBCU schools here. So we're actively engaging with the alumni associations. We're actually taking the trophy to several of the schools to try to promote this event. And the 17 coaches, Major League Baseball, and the Players Association combined, and they select the 50 best, what they consider to be the 50 best players. Uh, from the HBCU schools to participate in this game. So this will take place on the Friday night, July 12th. This will be in Globe Life Field. So we're looking forward to hosting those young men uh, for the second Swingman Classic. And I expect that Ken will be on site to support it again. So it's a really neat initiative last year in Seattle. We're hoping to take it to next level here. So uh, if you can't maybe get into some of the other All-Star events, but we'd like to see the uh, Swingman Classic, it's on that Friday night. So please, please feel free to join us. Then for the rest of the weekend, so the pictures you're seeing here are all of Rangers, most of them anyway, Rangers people uh, participating last year in Seattle. But I wanted, it was important, I think, to incorporate some of these pictures over young folks. So as you may or may not know, we have a, a youth academy in West Dallas. And there's a competition that starts on Friday uh, on the morning of the Swingman Classic with the Commissioner's Cup. So on the boys' side in baseball, the Commissioner's Cup, and this will be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and teams compete from the academies across the country for the right to come to Arlington this year to participate in the Commissioner's Cup. So last year, these are some of our young people from our West Dallas Academy that got to go to Seattle, participate, and play for three days and then stick around for the Home Run Derby and the All-Star Game. So quite an experience for these young people. Same thing on the girls' side. The Jenny Finch Classic will also be over at the Youth Academy starting on Friday morning. It's a weekend competition, and the, these young ladies will also have the opportunity to stay and experience the full All-Star Week. So we're excited about hosting that at the Academy. Uh, play, uh, play Ball Park last year, I think we're morphing this into what we're going to call the All-Star Village this year. So this is sort of our fan experience, and, and this takes on a different shape every every year uh, wherever the event's being held. Last year, this was at Lumen Field, which is where the Seahawks actually play football. But that facility is next door to where the Mariners play baseball. And they have sort of an expo hall there. So what you're seeing is some of the indoor activities uh, that took place last year in Seattle. So this kicks off on Saturday morning, it goes Saturday through Tuesday, 10 to 8 on Saturday, Sunday, 10 to 6 on Monday, Tuesday, when we have the bigger events at Globe Life Field. But this is sort of a fan experience, interactive, much lower price point. 
great place to bring a family. We're going to utilize Choctaw Stadium, the North Lawn adjacent to Choctaw, and then the eSports Arena and the old Expo Center, uh, the previous Arlington Convention Center to create this footprint. It's about 650,000 square feet uh, in total between the three venues, if you include the lawn. We're having some pretty uh, good conversations, I would say, with the Army Corps of Engineers, because we actually want to build a bridge across Mark Holtz Lake so that we can go from the lawn side over to the eSports Stadium side. Fortunately, in July, the, uh, there's not as much water running through the lake there, so I think we're going to be okay getting it done. So we've worked with the city and the Corps to try to move that forward, but that would be the primary passage across the water there to get from one side to the other. So the village will take place for four days. Uh, and then we get into the Globe Life Field events on Saturday. This is actually Owen White. Uh, Owen, one of our AAA pitchers, uh, was in camp with the Big League Club this year. He started for the American League last year. So this is typically a Saturday afternoon game. And these are usually AA and AAA players, the higher levels of development for the major league teams that will compete in the Futures game. This is, like I say, Saturday afternoon, probably around 3 o'clock followed by a celebrity softball game. So we'll see, uh, we'll see who we end up with the celebrity list, uh, but that will follow. It's a five inning game. It's really more for fun and, and a lot of entertainment. And we're looking at trying to maybe add some music after this. So Major League Baseball is trying to see if we can extend that day a little bit more, maybe do a 45, 50 minute concert after the event. So celebrity softball would also be part of Saturday. On Sunday, the Major League Baseball draft. Uh, it was announced a few weeks ago. The draft is actually gonna be here in Fort Worth. It will be at Caltown Coliseum. I know a number of our sponsorship groups are gonna be staying up in the Stockyards area and all over Fort Worth. So uh, the draft this year will be at Caltown Coliseum on Sunday night. So that's a quiet day at the ballpark, but the draft will sort of carry the day on Sunday in addition to the uh, All-Star Village. Then we get to Monday. This is an image of Adoles last year. We know he can hit home runs, so he competed last year in the Home Run Derby representing the Rangers. So that will be on Monday night at Globe Life Field. Uh, Tuesday, before the All-Star Game, now day of the game, uh, Major League Baseball has created a red carpet show. So it was at the public market last year in Seattle. So we logistically, we had the bus players over, get them, we had a lunch for them there, to got them lined up. This is actually Josh Young and his family as they were walking the red carpet last year. So this year, uh, our player hotel is probably gonna be the new Lowe's Arlington. So we'll be moving the families from the Lowe's Arlington over and we'll, we'll walk the plaza there uh, from one end to the other. So it is an opportunity for fans and for the families uh, to sort of get dressed up and walk the red carpet as we prepare for All-Star Night. So uh, like I say, I think we'll be on the plaza this year. Uh, and that will take place on Tuesday afternoon prior to the All-Star Game. And then of course that night, the 94th All-Star Game, uh, this is a shot of Corey Seager last year uh, as he prepared for one of his at-bats on that Tuesday night. And then transitioning out of that, I just, uh, of course, I have to sell, right? I've got to sell the whole building. So if you're, uh, if you're not inclined to baseball or UFL or anything else, we've got music. So we've got five concerts on the books this year. Chris Stapleton comes back in June. Def Leppard and Journey. Make sure to write down these dates, August 12th. Green Day. I don't book the bands, by the way. That's one thing I will not take. Uh, I mentioned Kane Brown earlier, so Kane is going to come and perform for us in September. And then if you had tickets for the Pink Show last year, uh, unfortunately, the artist had to cancel it. We, she canceled and tried to reschedule, had to cancel again. Hopefully, uh, we can play that concert this year. It is scheduled for November 6th, so I expect she'll be out on tour uh, a little bit prior to that, but the Pink Show is coming back in November. So we've got a little bit of everything planned. And if you haven't been over our way lately, on January 13th, we did cut the ribbon on the new Lowe's Arlington Hotel. Uh, John Tisch was in for the ribbon cutting. It's about a $550 million investment by the Tisch family. The second Lowe's Hotel that they've located in Arlington. Uh, these are now connected via a sky bridge across Randall Mill Road. Uh, so 888 rooms, so affectionately dubbed the Ocho internally is the working name. Just a couple images of uh, some of the different areas of this new hotel. The boardrooms, typical guest room there. Uh, that's a portion of a suite, I believe. Uh, Farina is their three meal restaurant. As Mr. Tish said on the day they cut the ribbon, he said, we spent $550 million on the project. I think we spent $500 million of it 
on these two pizza ovens here. <laughs> I think they heat to about 900 degrees. Really fascinating though that this is their three meal restaurant and there are a couple of other concepts that will be coming online here uh, shortly. But uh, they sent their culinary team to Italy for three months to train with chefs over there. All their food, or excuse me, all their pasta, all their sauces are made fresh on site every day. The Lowe's team does a great job on the culinary side, but they, they always like to feature and highlight these particular ovens. So uh, I've eaten there several times, took my daughter there last Friday. We had a fantastic meal. So if you're over, it's open at any time. And in fact, they have an area adjacent to the restaurant that they call the veranda, which is an outdoor seating area. So either before or after a game, if you'd like to stop and let traffic get out of the way, you can either come into Farina and they'll serve the Farina menu out there. So you can sit on the veranda, overlook uh, one of the two pools out there and uh, have a meal and wait for traffic to, uh, to pull out of the area if you're at a Rangers game. And then the new Arlington Convention Center. So this was another part of the project. Uh, so the old convention center, as I mentioned, uh, actually is the eSports Stadium and soon to be the home of the new Arlington Museum of Art, which is relocating from downtown Arlington in about 5,000 square feet to a former Expo Hall, which is now about 50,000 square feet. So their first exhibit, Pompeii, and again, I'm off track here a little bit, but Pompeii opens on March 30th. So if you want to see that, uh, it'll be at the new Arlington Museum of Art over in the old convention center space. But new convention center gives us about 260,000 square, new square footage of meeting and, and expo hall. This will be managed by the Lowe's team. And if you incorporate the, uh, if you incorporate the live by Lowe's, the first hotel in its meeting room, you have about 300,000 square feet of meeting space between the two properties. So as a CBB chair, you know, we had a study done a few years ago and one of our consultants said that if you have about 200,000 square feet of meeting in Expo Hall, you can compete for about 80% of the business that's out there. So for Arlington, you know, we don't need a million or two million square feet like Dallas has. We don't probably don't need as much square footage as Fort Worth has as larger markets. But we're competing now uh, for that business Sunday through Thursday, which is really important for Arlington. We had uh, the first big group, we opened on the 13th. On the 20th, we had Texas Instruments in for a week, sold out the new hotel. We had Boston Scientific was in here this week. So it's been really interesting to see uh, how that has helped business in the area. So, uh, but this is a this is a shot from the live by Lowe's across the street to the New Arlington Convention Center. Top ballroom up on top, by the way, is 51,000 square feet, which I'm told is the largest hotel ballroom in the state of Texas. I guess the biggest convention center ballroom is at the Henry B. Gonzalez ballroom in San Antonio at 54,000 square feet. So this one's 51,000 square feet and can be subdivided. So we're looking forward to trying to fill that up here uh, collectively. And now I have to, again, we opened the Starbucks this year, Rangers. So, that, you know, it's funny, I, I was talking to Mike and we were talking about, I do less and less ballpark operations these days. And I do things like I'm running point for the All-Star game. I do, I do our major league schedule. So I'm trying to juggle World Cup dates around <laughs> Rangers games. And I, I've gotten sucked into these development projects too. So another thing we've done at Choctaw Stadium is we took the old West Box office and there was a pro shop about 2,200 square feet. And we thought, gosh, it's right across the street from the hotel on Nolan Ryan Expressway. So we opened the Starbucks there. So that opened last August. And then uh, coming in May, El Tiempo Cantina, that's not our restaurant, but uh, it'll have a fountain similar to that. Uh, we're gonna open a Tex-Mex concept closer to the first base gate. Uh, El Tiempo is a Houston-based restaurant, the Lorenzo family, if you're familiar with Nitra's restaurants in Houston for many years. Nitra's son, uh, Roland, has now taken over the family mantle. He had been in North Texas previously up in, I think he had six restaurants here, he told me maybe in the mid 90s. They got out of the market, but Mr. Liebman, who's my boss, has a relationship with Mr. Lorenzo, and we decided, you know, he loves their food, so we're going to bring the concept back up here. And he's excited to be back in North Texas, so we're really looking forward to that one. We're almost there. Like I say, probably mid-May we'll have that open. And then uh, over on the right side of this image is the residential complex we have underway with the quarters companies and the Rangers. Uh, called One Ranger's Way. This is our first, we're dipping our toe into luxury residential. So this is just on the north side of the new hotel tower. Uh, it's about 300 units over there. So if you wanna actually live, work and play, you can now do that in a walkable distance. And then the National Medal of Honor Museum. Mike briefly touched on that. This shot, as you can see in the upper right corner, uh, I actually captured off the screen there uh, from March 11th. It will open, uh, so we got about a year to go. Uh, National Medal of Honor Day is on March 25th. 
So I think Chris Cassidy and the team are looking for a time frame close to that date uh, next next March uh, to formally open the museum. But they've made a tremendous amount of progress. This is the site on the north side of Mark Holtz Lake. It used to be where the youth ballpark was located, but that land was donated to the museum. They've had great success with their fundraising. They've still got a little ways to go, but uh, you can see this is really taking shape now. And uh, we're, we're coming down the stretch with about a year to go. So I wanted to make sure that I included that one. And I think those are all of my slides. So I, a little bit of story about this one. If you look closely at this, I included this slide in every presentation I did last year, last year. All right, so at this time of year last year, I was out making the presentation because I tend to run through all these other things that we're doing, right? Hotels and residential and Starbucks and Tex-Mex and, and everything else. And I just wanted to remind people that when we come to work every day, my job's changed a little bit, but when our organization, we show up to work every day, last year I told people that our objective was, still remains and always will be to win the World Series. So I wanted to send that message last year. I said, because I've showed you all this other stuff, right? You know, it's like the, like the wizard, right? I'm behind the curtain over here. We got all this stuff going on, but who's who's minding the store on the baseball team? So I included that. If you look carefully, you actually see orange and blue confetti. And if you recognize buildings in downtown Houston, that's actually from the 22 parade in Houston. And I was gonna pull it out, but I said, you know what? I'm gonna leave it in because I wanna remind you that no matter all the other things I've showed you in there, we show up every day totally focused on winning the World Series again and doing it again this year so we haven't forgotten <laughs> on cue that amazing? No. Am, am i good or what that's true yeah it's a true story when i was in houston we did an easter Sunday morning service with Lakewood Church and Joel Osteen was up there giving his closing, you know, his closing remarks up there. And just before he closed on that Easter morning, there was a thunderstorm that so often happens in Houston, rolled into the area and there was this huge roar, clap of thunder like that. And Joel, Joel froze for a second. I don't even remember what he said, but he, he pulled it off. But I'm, I'm going to take credit for that. That's I, I never, I never forgotten that. That was impressive. I've got, I think I've got a few minutes. If there are any questions, I can. I haven't seen Wyatt Langford in person. Uh, well, I've seen him on TV and I've read a lot about him. And uh, we had a report that came back in our staff meeting on Wednesday from Chris Young. Chris couldn't participate that day, but he sent a note back to Mr. Davis and said, Wyatt Langford's not just the best hitter in our camp, he's the best hitter in the Cactus League right now. So I hope that I hope that is true. Yes, ma'am. So you in brief said the word World Cup. Oh, yeah. World Cup. How are people getting from all over North Texas to that stadium without public transportation? Yeah, good question. Um, that's a fair question. I, you know, I've attended the last couple of uh, RTC meetings. I don't know if you've ever gone to a regional transportation council meeting over at COG. The past couple have been pretty interesting. Uh, we have been working out for about a year with, and again, it's it's not my event. I mean, it's AT&T Stadium's event, but we have been working closely with COG. Of course, COG was part of the presentation team that presented to FIFA. Uh, and, and we expect that, you know, the vast majority of people coming for the event are used to taking public transportation. So Mr. Morris has a plan. Uh, we'll incorporate TRE, uh, then probably some transition to bus. We're scouting locations for a transit center in Arlington in close proximity to the stadiums. Now we know that most local people are, are gonna drive, right? We, we expect that, we handle that. I mean, that's not unusual for us. We've played Cowboys and we've played World Series and Cowboys games with Six Flags open for Fright Fest head to head. So, I mean, we're, we're used to dealing with 100 to 120,000 people in the district at a given time. So that's that's not unusual for us. Uh, but I think you're gonna see a, a customer base much more dependent on public transportation. So TRE's, TRE's gonna have to play a role in that. I think it's in Dallas and it's, right? Yeah, so probably. I've got a, I'm from Spain and I have a hotel room in yeah. Frisco. Yeah. I'm going to expect to get on something. Right. I, I just. It's not an easy answer, is it? Yeah. Well, I, I, 
like I say, we're, we've been in discussions about it for a long time. We're, right now, we've identified a number of projects we're trying to complete. A lot of it's low hanging fruit. We're trying to get someone in place for All-Star Game. We, I've offered to Michael and I've been telling him for a year now, feel free to test for All-Star, but we know for All-Star that a lot of those guests are gonna be local because they're a season ticket base and then probably sponsors who we will be busing in. So we may do some trial runs for All-Star Game and try to promote the fact that we can connect to TRE and get into the entertainment district. We've got, we're down to two, maybe three potential locations for drop-offs to see how they flow back into the ingress and egress traffic. Uh, but I I hear you loud and clear. Yes, sir. What is your biggest concern the Season. Biggest concern, I, it's always pitching. It is, always has been, and always will be. I think in 150 or so years that we're playing baseball. Yeah, I think it's, it's got to be pitching. Because, you know, you've got DeGrom, you've got Scherzer, and you've got uh, Trevor Malley that are all waiting in the wings. We just have to make sure that we can keep our head above the water, I think, until they start to get back. Now, uh, in that same report that Chris sent back to the staff, I think uh, Scherzer's actually been cleared, I think, to start doing some light throwing. I don't know that that means, you know, Mike and I were talking about that. I hope that means he's ahead of schedule, but it remains to be seen. But it, it's always pitching. I think our offense will be fine. With with Carter and Langford in the lineup this year, I mean, who could have expected Evan Carter to do what he he did last year? And now he, he appears to be, you know, in a good place. Langford, now granted, it's spring training. I, I, I will qualify that because I've seen a lot of guys have great spring trainings and then they're back to hitting 220. But... Langford's not a 220 hitter. He proved that at multiple levels in the minor leagues last year. So I think he's legit. I think the lineup's going to be fine. Our defense is sound. We just need to make sure that the pitching, but between Bruce Bochy and Mike Maddox, I think they do a pretty good job with pitching staff. So, yes, sir. You just mentioned uh, Wyatt and Evan Carter. So I read that there haven't been a lot of teams that have two 22-year-old or younger rookies. Only one of them has been Champion, so it's really exceptional. I'm not yep. sure it's a question. It's about yep. the Rangers. It's just exceptional that we have that level. Yeah, it really is. The question where the comment was sort of related to Langford and Carter and having two players as young as they are. And Langford is actually older than Carter, which is just, just boggles my mind having a 22 year old child. Uh, but it is pretty remarkable. It's a testament to the player development system. You know, Carter, if you remember, if you follow our draft, the day we drafted Evan Carter, the commentators didn't know who he was. Uh, part of that was related to COVID because we, we sort of saw him. A couple of their teams were also following him. They sort of fell by the wayside. They dropped off during COVID. But we stayed with him and stayed with his family. And uh, when it came time to draft, you know, when we selected him, people were looking at each other saying, you know what, who is this guy? Nobody knew who he was. I guess my question is, have you ever thought about doing play-by-play? -play? You have a great speaking. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. I think that ship's probably sailed. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, so I, true story. I have done PA once, though. I, well, multiple times. In graduate school, I was the voice of Sarge Fry Field for the University of South Carolina for two years. Unbeknownst to me until the day before, my boss told me, oh, by the way, you do the PA, too. So I had a little bit of experience. And then one night in the Astrodome, it's a true story, our PA guy didn't show up. So, so I've done one major league game, actually. I got behind the microphone. I can read a script. Yeah. Good question. Oh, one more. Yeah, one more. I know that there's, for baseball enthusiasts, opportunities for people to get involved in the MLB All-Star Game as volunteers. Is that still open and how do you you know, actually, they don't do volunteers anymore. Uh, I think they ran into some problems in California a few years ago, maybe Washington State. So there are people that can be paid as part of the experience team. Uh, we are getting ready to hire two interns now that are going to help us to manage that locally. So it's called the experience team. And typically, those folks will come in and support the All-Star Village. And it's interesting because in Seattle last year, I ran into a lady that I knew here, uh, and she's part of the experience team. She has done it for years. She plans her vacation in the summer, and she goes wherever the All-Star game is, and she's part of the experience team. And she was in Seattle last year, so she'll be here this year. So it's called the experience team. I think we'll try to get something posted on our website as soon as we get the interns hired. I think they're supposed to come online in April. And then they will be sort of leading the charge in terms of trying to put that staff together. But you actually get paid now, so it's it's a better gig. You, know, you don't have to volunteer. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you, guys.
Thank you very much, Rob. Um, Rotary, for those of you who are uninitiated, has a big push towards eradicating polio. This week, we are 20 weeks from our last reported case of polio in the world, in the whole world. We are this close to eradicating this horrific disease. In honor of your presentation today, our club has made a donation to the Rotary Polio Plus Fund, and this is a memento of that. Thank you very much. Thank you again for a wonderful uh, educational speech or presentation. Now, closing announcements next week. Carol Klocek, Chief Executive Officer, Center for Transforming Lives. Next week is the last week also to support the International Committee's Refugee Project, SNAP the QR, if you want to participate. Finance Committee in the Rotary Office, Suite 305 on the third floor. Finally, the membership survey will be available through March 22nd. Please take part. Your opinion does matter. Sunday, is St. Patrick's Day. And in, uh, in the spirit of such, may the saddest day of your future be no worse than the happiest day of your past. With that, this meeting is adjourned.